Hello everybody, Nelson Virgil here with um, DiscountingLabs.com and ExcelMail.com. Today I'm going to review uh, kind of an old paper it's from 2001 um, in the American Journal of Physiology and Endocrinology and Metabolism. This is one of, in my, in my point of view, obviously I always think that way, but one of the most important papers um, the author again is Dr. Bassin. He's probably the leading, in my point of view, researcher on not only testosterone, on androgens uh, for the last uh, 30 years or so. He's, he's the only one that has really tested different doses of testosterone uh, in men and women and measured different things. In this study, one probably one of the most interesting ones, um, he's actually measuring hormones, all kinds of uh, hormones. Uh, strength, sexual function, etc., uh, by giving men, uh, young men, uh, different doses of testosterone and seeing what happens. These are, I'm going to go through the paper really quickly and trying not to uh, bore you guys with too many details. Although, obviously, if you're watching this uh, video, you're more inclined to enjoy data more than just general, um, you know, opinions that a lot of people on the internet have. I, trend, I tend to be more of a science guy. But anyways, the interesting thing is that this, this uh, group of uh, researchers here in the States um, picked a few 65 or so young men, uh, average age of 25. They're in good shape. They're not really fat or, or too skinny. And they, they actually blocked their testosterone. They injected them with a testosterone blocker and then gave them uh, different doses uh, once a week of testosterone and cpionate injections, 25 milligrams a week, 50, 125, 300, up to 600 milligrams a week of testosterone in anthate for 20 weeks. So that in itself is something you'd hardly see, even in 2023, uh, where uh, researchers are actually going that high and actually blocking people's testosterone and then obviously to add on testosterone after they block it. So very interesting study. It answers a lot of questions that you guys have when it comes to what doses are really the most effective for strength uh, improvements, muscle growth, um, et cetera, IGF-1, and all the different uh, values on different block work. So the participants, believe it or not, for 20 weeks were, not, were asked not to go to the gym, not to work out. Um, and they kind of be, tried to evaluate whether or not they were sticking to that every four weeks or so. Remember, this is a 20-week um, study, right? And they're giving them shots every week. Uh, they come into the clinic and giving them testosterone and anthate shots at different doses, depending, obviously, on the group that they were selected to. Um, so I'm going to go through tables really quickly. I'm not going to go through the entire paper because obviously it would get, um, you guys would not watch me. Most of you don't even hang out for five minutes. Um, there was no significant change in the, the daily intake of, um, you know, food, protein and all that. So all these uh, changes that you're going to see soon are not related to um, increased um, appetite or, or uh, food intake. And obviously they were not working out. That's the most um, striking thing that I'm going to explain uh, as I roll down on the study. Um, very young, 28, 29, 25, you know, in the 20s, BMI pretty healthy, 23, 25, 25, different groups obviously, these are different doses. And um, the healthy testosterone levels at baseline before they shut them down with uh, the, the testosterone blocker injection, they were all in the 500s, 600s, you know, good for that age, for the 20 something age. And they were obviously not, not obese or heavy. And there are 12 uh, guys in every uh, group, 13 on the 600, but I think they lost a few, one to acne, and, but most people stuck around for the study for the 20 weeks. So this is what they did. They, they measured total testosterone, free testosterone, LH, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, and IGF-1. Um, from this is from baseline from before obviously they got the testosterone blocked to uh, week 16 in this case uh, where it, most everybody was still in the study so obviously as the testosterone dose increased depending obviously on the group so did uh, the tes total testosterone uh, you can see a baseline was this um, at 16 weeks it was 1300 2300 on the higher doses 
interesting enough, and you can you guys can see now, and I, I get that question asked a lot on ExcelMail.com. What is the the optimal dose uh, to replace testosterone every week for men? And you can see some the men that got twenty five milligrams actually had a decrease in testosterone from five ninety three to two fifty three. That's not enough, obviously, 25, weeks, uh, 25 milligrams a week. The ones that got 50 milligrams a week, still, the testosterone went out. The ones that got 125, interesting why they didn't pick 100, but 125, yeah, it went up, obviously, to almost the baseline number, okay? So I, I would say 100 to 125 gets you back, would get, at least in this, in this uh, younger man, to back to baseline when it comes to testosterone. Once you go to more like the bodybuilding doses, 300, 600 milligrams a week, then you go into the 1300, so 2300 total testosterone nanograms per deciliter. And then you see here, there's a p-value that shows that it's statistical significance. There's a, definitely a big difference, 300 and 600, but it already starts to show, show up around 125, okay? So that's eh, no brainer. Free testosterone as the testosterone dose goes up, free testosterone uh, goes up, okay? So that's also a no-brainer. We kind of know this because testosterone increases doses of testosterone, decrease sex hormone binding globulin, and we see it here. As you go up on the dose, the uh, sex hormone binding globulin goes down. There's actually statistical significance, p-value by 300 and 600 milligrams starts obviously going towards that at 125. When you see 25 and 50, it actually, um, um, it, it, it's not as, as uh, although here we have a kind of a fluke on the 50. So there's a variation. This is a very small data set of 12 patients per um, uh, milligram dose. Um, and obviously I don't think anybody's gonna repeat this study. This was done, what, 22 years ago. And now we have, to be honest with you, more stigma and more hangups about research of this type. Anyway, so I get also this question. Nelson, what is the effect of testosterone doses on IGF-1? And, um, you know, they don't see a statistical significance really uh, at the 25, 50, and 125 milligrams a week testosterone and anti injection doses, but they see obviously uh, uh, higher doses and uh, bodybuilding doses, they start seeing a statistical significance, an actual increase. You actually see decreases in IGF-1 until you get even at 125. Obviously, as I said, the p-value may not be there. So, mm, so that's not completely um, surprising. Uh, the higher the dose, the bodybuilding doses of 300 to 600 milligrams a week show that IGF-1, uh, the, the metabolite of growth hormone in the liver, uh, goes up, okay? And these are guys that were not supposedly uh, uh, working out at all. They were actually forbidden to do so. So um, the question is, what would happen if actually somebody is working out? There, would the IGF-1 actually go up even higher? Hey, that's a good hypothesis. We may never see a study that actually measures that. So the body composition analysis, what happened to their bodies? Fat-free mass, which is basically lean mass and some water retention was definitely changed, improved uh, right at 100, 125 milligrams or so a week. And you can see, obviously, it gets, it gets more so as you go up in dose. Fat mass goes down with testosterone. Um, the interesting thing here, as you can tell, when you're subdosing, when you're dosing somebody too low, like 25, 50 milligrams, they're actually fat mass increased here. Once you go to the 100, 125, 300, obviously the fat mass uh, goes down. And there's uh, right here, we start seeing a better response, although there's kind of a fluke here too. But you see in the first two small doses, you're actually doing more harm than good by underdosing somebody uh, with testosterone. This is by DEXA. This is basically by uh, the first fat free, fat free mass was done by underwater uh, measurement. Basically, they put you in, um, in a, basically in a container and they do, they see what the displacement of your body uh, is compared to the water you displaced. It's a long, but it's actually very accurate. DEXA is even more so. And it basically agrees with the, the underwater measurements. And the ratio of total water to fat-free mass 
percentage didn't really uh, uh, did not really, really reach uh, statistical significance. So their muscle that they were getting or the fat free mass was mostly uh, lean mass, not water retention. Although you can see the water definitely goes up as you up in dose when it comes to the percentage, the ratio. I'm going to go through the graphs because really, uh, I'm basically tables are saying the same thing. So when they measure the thigh, the muscle volume of the thigh by MRI, this is that MRI test. This is not measuring the actual volume. This is a very accurate. They spend money on this uh, study. Uh, we see uh, a significant uh, difference at rate of 125. Once again, the guys are not working out. What happens if they did go work out three, four times a week like most of us do? Well, you would have seen that even more so of an increase. So the volume of the thigh and the volume of the quads, you know, so the actual, you know, quads on MRI also the same, the same. So 125, 100. They, I wish I had picked 100 because a lot of people are 100 milligrams a week. I am. Uh, and 125, it's just basically 25 milligrams more. But I will ask that to Dr. Basini if I ever talk to him again. The interesting thing, this is this is where it gets a little like, okay, all right, this explains why some people may expect too much sexually from testosterone. But the sexually sexual activity scores, and this was uh, done by questionnaires, really did not. You can see the p-value here. It's not, you know, p-value to be pretty significant, 0 0.01, 0, 0, 0.001, or 0, 0, 0.05, whatever, at least one or two zeros after the, the, the point here did not reach a uh, huge significance. In fact, the sexual activity, meaning how many, how many um, uh, sexual inter uh, intercourses were they having, did not really change. Actually, it went up in some, but it went down at the higher dose a little bit. But obviously, nobody can make conclusions of this because the p-value never really goes down to significance. So it's probably because of the sample size too. It's only 12 uh, guys per, per, per arm. And the intensity of sexual desire, meaning your libido, how horny they were, you know, starts, uh, you know, starts getting better at um, at 300 and 600, but really, um, they not really improve that much at all, or actually decrease at the lower doses. So libido did not, and these are young men, these are men with libido, but remember, these guys were giving up testosterone blocker before they started giving them testosterone. So I don't know if I had any effect, to be honest with you, to actually block first. Um, nobody has ever really studied that in detail. Cognition did not change um, at all with the doses, um, not at least with 65 guys, the, the sample size. And uh, this is where it also gets very interesting. Uh, sorry about that noise. The leg press strength and the leg power, and these were measured every four weeks without having them work out, obviously, they have um, the measure that actually went up on the 300 statistical significance at 300 and 600. And this is also my guys that are not working out. If they were working out, I'm sure it would have been a bigger, much bigger uh, change. This is when it gets kind of like, okay, uh, now we're, let's talk about the blood work. We know very well that testosterone increases hemoglobin and red blood cells and hem hematocrit. Uh, there's still a lot of arguments uh, about um, whether or not what is the magic highest number of hematocrit to start causing cardiovascular issues. Nobody has really answered that. Some studies are pointing at 50, 52, 53, um, but we don't really have good data. But anyways, uh, this, the higher the testosterone dose, obviously the higher the hemoglobin. Um, the same, PSA did not change much. You know, there's only a little bit of a statistical difference here at 600, but you can see 0.5 to 0.7. These are young guys with low PSA, so there was no big. But HDL, the good cholesterol, actually goes down as testosterone dose goes up. Not surprising at all. So that, that was, uh, that's when you pay the price for a higher dose, uh, HDL going down and, and hematocrit hemoglobin going up. That's when you start increasing risks, uh, cardiovascular risk. So that's it, guys. I hope uh, you enjoyed this one. I hope it answers some questions. Remember, these are younger guys, uh, not obese, not working out. Uh, their food uh, intake was not changed, but a um, very interesting study that we probably will never see anything like this again. Thanks a lot, and hopefully you'll see the next uh, 
I think I'm going to do one or two this week uh, like this one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.